what you say you'll do And you'll be who you've always been to us Jesus Our hope is in you alone Our strength in your mighty name Our peace in the darkest day remains Jesus This we know We will see the enemy run This we know We will see the victory come We hold on to every promise you ever made Jesus, you are unfailing Our guide through the wilderness Our joy in the heaviness No way, Jesus This we know We will see the enemy run This we know We will see the victory come We hold on to every promise you've ever made
trust He is here A carpenter healer With hands that give life He is here The God who designed us Who walked down our roads Who died for all sin on his back for my sin all the guilt that was mine he cried out in his finish forever he left all to accomplish lived a life that was blameless he was my cross on his back for my sin all the guilt Let's open our Bibles this morning to Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. And uh, our focal passage will be uh, primarily verses 26 through 32 as we talk this morning about the destiny of the crowd as we continue this series on the gospel uh, in the crowd. It was General Patton that made the, the comment uh, long ago that if everybody is thinking the same thing, then somebody's not thinking. It's, it's about a mob mentality, a herd mentality. It's what happens whenever you find yourself in a crowd. It's an interesting social phenomenon when uh, we become nothing more than pack animals. And really that's rooted, the mob mentality, uh, the herd mentality. It's really a, a social phenomenon that finds its roots in, in a desire to fit in, to be a part of something. Think about riots after sporting events. Uh, think about runs on banks. Think about the Salem witch trials. Uh, thinking about, uh, think about jumping off a cliff because all your friends did. That, that's a herd mentality. That's the mob mentality. And it can be a, a very dangerous thing. It can throw you into a situation, this mob mentality. You can find yourself being caught up in these kind of phenomena, and you can find yourself uh, on that path following the crowd, even when, when you know the results are going to be disastrous. It can cause you to act in ways that, that you normally would, would not. Think about how people behave at, at athletic events. Think about what people post on social media. I mean, I never cease to be amazed at what people will say at an athletic event, what they will holler and scream at, at athletes on a field, 18 to 22-year-olds. They, they'll say things that, that they would never say in person to, to another human being. That's why coaches always tell players, you don't play for fans. You play for those around you. You play, you play for, for your teammates. You play for the guy next to you in, in the trenches that, that understands what we have been through together. You don't play for fans. You know what fan stands for, don't you? I mean, what it's short for? It, fan is short for fanatic. A fanatic is, is an unbalanced thinker. And so you, you can't play for fans because fans, fanatics, are, are with you when, when you're winning, but, but they jump off the wagon whenever you start, start losing. So you don't play for fans. You, you play for the room. You play, play for, your, for your family. Play for the guys in, in the trenches. The crowd is, the crowd is, is very fickle. You think about the life and the ministry of Jesus for three years. I mean, Jesus brought hope to the nation of, of Israel. Here we have this one who is finally going to be the, the fulfillment of God's redemptive purposes for, for Israel. They've seen, they've seen hundreds 
that have been healed physically. We don't have all of them documented here. John, in John's gospel, he would say that, that there's not enough books to contain all the things that Jesus said and, and Jesus did. But he, but he healed hundreds, thousands, had their lives transformed and, and renewed. But what we find that, that happens with the crowd is that the crowd had rather live in darkness than, than in the light. The crowd is, is fickle. In the first year and a half of Jesus' ministry, when he was primarily focused upon healing, manifesting that the kingdom of God, the power of God was in their, their very midst. I mean, it was a very popular thing. This was a youth movement. It was a very popular thing to be a part of the crowd that was following Jesus. Then about a year and a half in, Jesus starts speaking more pointedly. He starts talking more, more about it is appointed unto the Son of Man to suffer and to die. He started using language that was hard and difficult and challenging, stuff about, about taking up your cross and following after him. And in the Gospels, we find that it, that it oftentimes would, would say that the crowd found his words to be hard. And there would be a great falling away. Fickled crowd. But then those that would fall away, they would come and they would go. You think about the last week of Jesus' life, the triumphal entry. Here are the, here are the people, the crowds, once again, praising Jesus. Hosannas to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet that same crowd, in just a matter of days, will be the very crowd hollering and crying, crucify him. A fickled crowd. And then the same, within 24 hours, the same crowd is in our text today. They are the same ones that are lamenting and weeping for him. Notice how things unfold. It says in verse 26, when they led him away, they seized a man. This is Luke chapter 23, verse 26. They seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country and placed, and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And following him was a large crowd of the people and of women who were mourning and, and lamenting him. Same crowd that was hollering, crucify him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things, listen to this question, for if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? If the crowd is doing this to me in the very best of times, when God is revealing himself and making, making himself known to the world through me in a way that he's never done it before. God incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. If you're doing this, if you're rejecting me in the very best of times, if you're not pursuing me and chasing me and following after me in what is the very best it will ever be as far as seeing the presence of God in your midst. If this is what's happening, what will happen in the future? I can tell you what happens because Jesus, the question he's asking here at the end, for if you do these things when the tree is green, when things are at their best, what will happen when it's dry, when things are at their worst? It's a proverbial question, but it's, but it's spoken with, with a prophetic tone because Jesus knows what will happen. What will happen is jump ahead to 70 AD and Jerusalem will be, will be devastated. Jerusalem will come under siege as a result of their revolt against Rome, 66 AD. Israel, the, would, the Jews would declare their independence. Rome, of course, was not going to allow this to happen. And under Titus, who would eventually become, become the emperor, they come, the Roman soldiers come into Jerusalem and they lay siege upon that city. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian during that time, 
documented the devastation that took place. The temple, the second temple, that is the temple of Herod, it, it was leveled. The city was, the, in fact, the entire city was leveled to its foundations. Subsequent travelers coming through that area of devastation would question, Josephus said, whether or not the city had ever been inhabited before. One point one million people were murdered. 70,000 more were carried away into captivity. Josephus wrote and he, he recorded that, that the Roman soldiers that flooded Jerusalem, he said they murdered and they plundered until there was no one left to receive their fury. It was that kind of devastation. And Jesus says it's going to be so bad that women who are barren, and understand in that Jewish tradition of that day and time, that was considered to be a curse. But Jesus said those women who, who are barren, who have barren wombs, who do not bear children at that time, things are going to be so devastating, things are going to be so bad that you will be blessed, you will be, you will be fortunate, you will be grateful that you don't have children going through this. And those who are unable to escape the city of Jerusalem, they will beg, they will plead, they will pray that God would allow the mountains and the hills to fall upon them, to kill them. That's what will happen. I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by crowd mentalities. A crowd can be a very dangerous thing, but there's also an opportunity when you find yourself caught up in a crowd and you see the momentum of a crowd and the movement of a crowd, for some it can, it can be an awakening. Because you see, the crowd that was around Jesus, this one, Simon, Cyrene, who was called out from among the crowd, this crowd that was, that was observing this, Jesus going to his, his crucifixion, that crowd is really a microcosm of this crowd today. In the presence of Jesus, they were lamenting, they were crying. The, you had the same crowd that was hollering, crucify him, that was shouting, crucify him. It's a very diverse crowd. It's a very fickle crowd. You know, and, and, and you know, we have our own fickleness, don't we? I mean, this crowd today is it's, it's no less a fickled crowd than the one surrounding Jesus 2,000 years ago. Do you know that every polling agency in this country considers regular church attendance to be, or they define regular church attendance to be once out of every four to six Sundays? 30 years ago, it was three out of four Sundays you had to attend a church to be considered a regular church attender. Now then, if you pop in once every four to six weeks, you're considered by polling agencies to be a, a regular church attender. Now, how, how fickle is that? I mean, it, it, it begs the, the question, am I, am, I, am I just someone that is, is confessing to be a Christian or am I, am I truly a devoted follower of, of Jesus Christ? Because there's, there's a difference between the two. And so I'm fascinated by mob mentalities, by, by the mentality of a crowd and what happens to a crowd. What is the destiny of the crowd? I wonder about those that were there that day. What was their destiny? What, what happened to them? What will happen to us, the crowd that, that is here today? Well, there, there, will, be, there will be some, to be sure, that, that will be unexpected converts. Out of every crowd that is in the presence of Jesus, and here's the message of Jesus, there, there's always unexpected converts. That's what happened to Simon of, of Cyrene, isn't it? There in verse 26, it says, when they led him away, that is speaking of Jesus, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country and placed on him the cross behind, behind Jesus. Simon of Cyrene, Cyrenicia is where he's from, one of the wealthiest capitals in northern Africa from an area that today is, is, is Libya, modern-day Libya. 
immerse yourself into the text here. So you have this man, Simon of, of Cyrene from Cyrenicia, and, and he's made his way. He's a pilgrim, probably has come for the Passover event. Maybe this is a, an annual trip for him, an annual pilgrimage that, that he makes. And so he's, he's traveled to Jerusalem, not unusual, because during Jewish festivals, especially, especially the major ones like, like Passover, Jerusalem would swell to over a million people. All the pilgrims coming in from everywhere. So maybe Simon is, is one of those, and, and here he is coming into, into Jerusalem, and, and he's there for the Passover event, and he notices a crowd along this way, this, this path, and like all of us, he's just like us. He, what does he do? He starts craning his neck. He starts rubbernecking. He starts looking, trying to see over the, the rows of crowd. He starts asking, hey, what's, what's going on up here? What's and maybe somebody says to him, well, it's, it's Jesus coming through. He, they're crucifying him today. Maybe Simon has heard something about Jesus. Maybe word has gotten to him in northern Africa. The, the, the word was spreading about this one who was performing such, such amazing miracles, the power of God being manifested in ways that it had never been seen before. And, and maybe Simon is in his mind thinking, man, I've heard about this guy. I've got to see him. And maybe he pushes his way through the crowd, shoulders his way, and all of a sudden he's there on the front line. The text says that, that he was seized. Mark and Matthew say that, that he was compelled. I like that, compelled. He was compelled to take, to take the cross. Now really what, what it was, what he was compelled to carry was the cross tie of of the cross. I know in our productions, our plays, you always see the person that portrays Jesus carrying this, this full cross. That, that's not really an accurate depiction. What someone, a uh, prisoner who has been punished to, to die by crucifixion, they just carried the cross tie. Places of crucifixion already had the main beams that were laying on the ground prepared to be put in a, a stationary place. So the prisoner only had to carry the, the cross tie, but, but no need getting into the details. Imagine all that, imagine all that Jesus has been through. The mockery of a trial, the beating, and, and, and all of that betrayal by friends, abandoned by those that were supposedly thought that were his followers. I mean, this man is under tremendous physical, spiritual, mental anguish. And so here is, here is Simon. Maybe an event he does every year, just part of my, part of my faith routine coming to the, to the Passover. And now all of a sudden, Simon finds himself thrown into the narrative of Jesus, thrown into the story of God's redemptive purposes through the person of Jesus Christ. And when I hear, when I hear Simon, when I see Simon being thrust into this story in the most unexpected way, when just the circumstances of his everyday life intersect with the providential purposes of God, now then all of a sudden he's, in the, he's part of the story. And every time I read this, I know that the truth is that there's some of us here today who have been compelled upon, we have been seized by the Spirit of God at a time when we never expected it. It was just the perfect providential intersection of the circumstances of our life and the intersection of God's purposes. Unexpected converts. For me, it was a, as a 21-year-old college student, never been to church, was kicked out of school, suspended for a semester, I was getting up on a Saturday morning. It was the sixth day. We were working six 10-hour shifts at what is now Chicago Bridge and Iron. I was a, a welder in a pipe shop. It was Saturday. I punched the clock at 7 o'clock, walked into that, that shop, and I punched the clock and put my card up, and I'm thinking about what am I going to do that night? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? What am I going to do on Sunday, my, my one day off? What am I going to do? It was just another day, just another, just another day of the grind, just another circumstance. It's just another day. Get up, go to work. 
Go through the motions of living, doing what you got to do, get a paycheck. Punched in at 7 o'clock that, that morning. When I put my head down on the pillow that night, I was a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. The next day by noon, I was a baptized follower of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, a newly baptized follower of Jesus Christ. And all of it, just in the routine of my day, was because a guy at work had enough care and concern to ask me if I'd ever made a commitment to follow Jesus in my life. And in just the routine of everyday life, when that intersected with the providential purposes of God for such a time as this, I made that decision to follow him and became an unexpected convert. See, that's what happened to Simon. Simon went to Passover, never expecting to become a follower of of Jesus, and yet Yet that's the very thing that happened. You see over in in Mark's account, in Mark chapter 15, in verse 21, it gives us a little bit more. It says they pressed into service. A passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, and in parentheses, the father of Alexander and, and Rufus. The father of Alexander and Rufus to bear his cross. Alexander and Rufus are very well known in the church in Rome. See, Simon never expected to become a follower of Jesus, and yet he became the Abraham of his family, paving the way for his sons, for his children, as oftentimes happens statistically, when the father, the head of the household, becomes a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And I believe there's people here today, I believe this every time I stand up here, I don't think it's a mistake that you're here. I think there's probably circumstances in your life, things going on in your life that that would bring you here and you're searching for something in your life and there's, there's, there's between your circumstances and the providential purposes of God, for whatever reason, I think you're here today to meet in an intersection. And maybe, maybe you're going to leave here today as an unexpected convert. But there's others in the crowd, not just those like Simon that would become an unexpected convert. There's also those in the crowd that I call, that I would call almost converts. Some in the crowd will be almost converts. That's those that are represented. Notice here in in verse 27, and following him was a large crowd of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. A large crowd of people. You know, Jesus always distinguished between the crowd and the church, didn't he? Jesus always distinguished between the crowd and disciples, those that were part of the larger crowd and those that were actual disciples. We've seen it in our our sermon series. Jesus, even last week, we saw goes back and forth between the crowd and the disciples says something very different to each one. He would speak to the crowds, and then the text might say something like, and he turned to his disciples and said. And so Jesus always distinguished between the crowd and those who are actual disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, in our crowd this morning, from, from my perspective, from my vantage point where I am, and I look out upon you, I don't, know, I don't know who are the disciples of Jesus and, and then who's just the crowd. Who is the act, who, who's a member of the actual body of Christ and, and then who's, ju- who's just here among the crowd from, from this perspective? I, I can't tell the difference. Don't be offended by that. That same thing Jesus would say in his parable, the wheat and tares. Wheat and tares, they look just alike until the time of, of the harvest and the Lord will separate the wheat and the tares. But from up here, it, it just looks the same. It's one thing to, it's one thing to, to confess, to say that you're a Christian. It's a, it's a whole other thing to actually be a Christian. And we live in a, we live in a country, not, and we live in a time not unlike what Jesus has described here when the tree is green, when we have every opportunity 
We're unencumbered. We're unhindered in our pursuit of our, of our faith. We have the freedom to come together and, and to worship. And we take it for granted. But the times are green right now. We have wonderful opportunity to be chasing our faith, preparing ourselves for the hard times that will come. But it's a very easy thing to say, I'm a Christian in this country, in the West. A whole different thing to be an actual devoted follower of Jesus Christ. I always like the story that was told by, of Abraham Lincoln when he was practicing law. He said there was a witness on the stand and Lincoln asked the, the witness, he said, how many, how many legs does a dog have? And she responded, four. And he said, okay, now let's, let's reframe that, that question, but the, let's pretend this time and let's say that, that the dog's tail is a leg. Now then, how many legs does the dog have? The woman said, well, that would be five. He said, no, the dog still has four legs. Just because you call a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. In the same way, just because you say you're a Christian, it doesn't make you a Christian. You see, one of the things that, that haunts me, one of the things that haunts me as a pastor who has the responsibility to be an under-shepherd and to look after the spiritual welfare of a people is understanding a crowd mentality, a herd mentality for the preponderance of confessing Christians in this country, especially in the evangelical South, what most people have embraced is a kind of American Christianity that is very different from biblical Christianity. And we need, we need to understand the difference between those two. The American, Christ, American Christianity that, that most confessing Christians have embraced, it's, it's a kind of, of Christianity, it's a, kind of, it's a form of religion that that is based upon a, a kind of sentimental nationalism. That if you love God, country, apple pie, Chevrolet, then, then that means I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. No, it doesn't. It means you're, it means you're a good American. There's a vast difference between being a good American and being a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, that, that's, a kind of, that, that's a kind of sentimental nationalism that simply has no support in Scripture. Biblical Christianity, on the other hand, is built around the person. It is focused upon the person of Jesus Christ and the impassioned, all-consuming pursuit of following after him. It defines who you are as a person. It informs every facet, every arena of your life, as you're seeking to live all of your life, the entirety of your life, under the umbrella of his, of his lordship. Jesus says, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. You know, these that are described here in verse 27, this large crowd of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. Do you know, in the, in the strictest sense, these, these, were, these were religious professionals. In that day and time, there were professional mourners. And in their Jewish tradition, they believed that, that they stored up spiritual merit. They gained spiritual merit by, by chasing funerals and mourning and lamenting. And you don't, want to be, you don't want to be caught out on the edges just being a religious professional because there's a very real possibility that you can be raised in church, you can go to church all your life and still just be part of the crowd. As the story concludes, you can go over to verses 48 and 49. It says, and all the crowds who came together for this spectacle when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts, and all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance seeing these things. You can come to church all your life, and the result be that you're just standing on the outside. You're standing on the perimeter. 
You can easily become a religious professional and never become a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. That's, that, that's what happens in a crowd. There's a final thing very quickly. Some we see will not, not only be unexpected converts, some will be almost converts, but then there's some who will be, who will be last minute converts. Notice in this passage in verse 32, I didn't read it earlier, but it says two others also who were, who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. Now, this, this part of the story is too rich to be missed. So look ahead to verse 39. It says one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at Jesus saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. People would ask me, and I don't hear the question that often anymore, but people would, would ask in the past, they would ask me if I believed in deathbed conversions. And I do believe in deathbed conversions. First of all, I think it's biblical. That, that's what this is. It's a deathbed conversion with this guy on the cross saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus. That is a, that is a deathbed conversion. Jesus didn't say, no, 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 can't do that. You hadn't been living for me. You hadn't been doing all the things you need to be doing. Because see, if Jesus said that, that would make salvation into something that is accomplished by your works instead of, your, instead of God's grace. And to be sure, salvation, what God offers, is always based upon the work that he has done through Jesus Christ, not the work that we do. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. I believe in deathbed conversions. I've seen deathbed conversions. This man is genuine. This man has a repentant heart. He's not like the other criminal that, that, that's hurling abuse at, at Jesus. This man actually reflects the fruit of a repentant heart, a repentant spirit. He has remorse for Jesus. He has remorse for the life that he has wasted. It's just tragically taking him a lifetime to get to, get to this point. I believe in, in deathbed conversions. I I've seen it. I believe that, that they are biblical. This isn't something like Ted Turner, who years ago in his agnosticism said something very critical of, of Christians and a publicist, publicist apparently got to him, said, you need to make a public retraction and, you know, and make up for this. And so he, got, you know, he blubbered through this apology to the, to the Christian community and, you know, and even made, tried to make light of it. And he said, oh, be sure, I'm going to be, when the end of my life comes, you can be sure I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call a priest or a pastor to come and I'm going to cover my bases like, like the thief on the cross. That, that's not what this thief on the cross is representing not that kind of flippancy deathbed conversions I believe in them because I've seen those kind of repentant hearts but how tragic it is that some people wait to the very end waste an entire life that could be used in service to the kingdom of God that's just the way it is sometimes sometimes it takes a lifetime of circumstances for an individual to get to a place of recognizing the frailty of their life, the mortality of their life, and that only God can do for them what they can never do for themselves. Back in the early 80s, when I was on staff at Green Acres Baptist Church in, in, in Tyler, there, we had a pretty extensive intern program, and uh, we'd have about 10 in, interns every summer that would come in from all over the country that were, that were seminary students. And they would get an opportunity to serve in the church and the community and to get practical, hands-on experience. We had this one intern that traveled with the uh, prison team to Huntsville to go, in this, to go into this prison to minister to, to the prisoners. And this intern went into a, into a cell on death row and started talking to this one uh, who was condemned to die about his relationship with God. 
talked about the plan of salvation and the desire that, that God would have for him to, to follow him. And, and the man became kind of belligerent, said, I don't need that. He said, I see jailhouse religion around here all the time, and I don't need, I don't need, I, I don't need any of that in my life. So our intern gets up to, to leave, and he starts down, walks out of the cell and starts to leave. And uh, a prisoner in the, in the cell next to this one who had overheard everything asked if he could speak with our intern. They unlocked the door and allowed him to go in. And, and he said, I heard everything you, you were saying to him. He said, I'm sentenced to die in 14 days. He said, do you think there's any chance for me at all to know God's grace and mercy? Our intern spent the next half hour just sitting with this man, talking to him about God's love about how much God loved him and how much God desired to extend to him mercy and, and grace and forgiveness. And that man committed his life to the Lord. That intern traveled back to, to Tyler. And when he got back, he wrote a letter to this prisoner. Just wanted to offer him some assurances and some uh, scripture verses of, of comfort. Never heard back from the man. On the day of, of the prisoner's execution, the chaplain at Huntsville, the head chaplain at Huntsville, called our intern personally. And he said, so-and-so, and called the man by name. He said, he asked me to call you. He said he apologized for not writing you back. He said he's been a bit preoccupied. But he said, before they... They put him to death when I was meeting with him. He asked me to be sure and tell you that he'll see you in heaven. I believe in, I believe in deathbed conversions. But why wait? I believe that, that there are here in this room right now, in this crowd, I believe that there are people here providentially. I don't know what's going on in your life. There's some sort of story going on in your life. There's events and circumstances that are going on in your life. Whatever they are, I'm convinced that this morning you are here because you have now intersected with the providential purposes of God. Why wait? Every one of us are going to have a destiny. Something is going to happen to each and every one of us. Why wait? What happened to the crowd back then? Well, there were some unexpected converts. There were some, some almost converts. There was deathbed converts. But why wait? What is your destiny? What's going to happen to you? It's a question that only you can answer. Let's pray together. Father, how grateful we are for your mercies, for your abounding grace that trumps all of our sins, all of our failures. How grateful we are, Lord, that, that your message of hope is one that the crowds long for. And Father, I pray that out of this crowd this morning, that if there, is some, if there is anyone here, if there is someone here this morning that has never answered to the prompting of your spirit, the, the compelling of your spirit to follow after you, that Lord, maybe this would be their day. Maybe they've been, been waiting, convincing themselves that there's a better time, a more appropriate time. that maybe they would hear that this is the time. And so we give this time of invitation to you. As your spirit invites us, might we respond? Might we respond by saying, yes, today I follow Jesus. Yes, today I begin the pursuit of chasing after him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For more information, give us a call or visit us online at firstlubbock.org. 
check out our other worship times, Sundays at 8.15 or 11 a.m. Experience these online or come visit us at Broadway and Avenue V in Lubbock. Download our mobile app to experience even more from First Lubbock. Thanks for watching. God bless and have a great week.